Uh, welcome to the PTGA's fourth uh, polar panelist session. This one's going to be on sustainability and stewardship, uh, which will include a lot of conservation topics, I'm sure, as well. Um, a little bit about the PTGA to start off, uh, just uh, for, for folks that might not be fully aware, uh, aware of what we do. So the PTGA, we're a nonprofit professional industry association. Uh, primarily, we're a standards and assessment body. So we're, uh, we, we can test polar guides to minimum comp competencies uh, on various skills related to uh, the polar profession. We're not a training body, uh, but we are happy to uh, be able to provide training opportunities like this uh, occasionally, uh, just because we're a, a, a great community of, of polar professionals here. So we have the ability uh, as an industry association to cross company and organizational boundaries and bring people together. Uh, and so we are able to focus uh, as part of our, our mission on bringing people together. So that's what today is all about. So thank you to our panelists for being here. Thank you to everybody for joining uh, to participate in this, this great coming together from all over the world. Today we're going to be talking about stewardship and sustainability. Uh, so opportunities for guides and for operators as well. Uh, you know, we hope to dive into share some concepts, but I think a lot of us are, are, are very aware of, you know, bigger picture concepts, things that we'd like to talk about. We're going to try to get a little more gran granular about what you can all do as guides in the field, how you can um, actually apply things, how you can get people involved, how you can turn them into ambassadors, how you yourself can give back um, within the industry and feel good about what you're doing with all of your travel. So that's what we'll be dump <clears throat> jumping into today. Uh, how about if we start off with some introductions from our esteemed panelists? And I might just go in, in order here of who is appearing on my screen. Um, Laura, would, would you like to start us off and tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you very much, Colby. I'm Laura, and greetings from snowy Ushuaia. Um, my background is originally in geological engineering, and I spent over a decade on boats doing geology prior to Antarctica. And actually, my first trip to Antarctica was on a sailboat that my husband built. Uh, it was also our honeymoon. And uh, from there, we started our company, Quixote Expeditions. And as an undergrad, I'd always traveled for field work and I used geology as a lens through which to view and understand my surroundings. So on that first trip, I had wanted to do the same. So I reached out to all my friends in academia looking for some sort of science to do, and everyone was super enthusiastic, um, but then no one actually came up with anything, and I actually gave up. Then luckily, thanks to Facebook, social media, I stumbled on a citizen science opportunity, and then ever since then, I've been doing citizen science in the polar regions. I'm now grateful and excited to be the chair of the Polar Citizen Science Collective, which was started by five guides, Bob Gilmore, Lauren Farmer, Alex Cohen, Annette Bombash, and Ted Cheeseman. And they were guides who saw a huge need and hole, the same hole I had for themselves and for other guides. And I hope I'll get to delve into some of the details, um, but I'm just excited that this organization exists that fills a need I, I had when I first started. And I'm also a PTGA guide and excited to chat with you all today. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Court Whalen, how about we go to you next? Hey, thanks so much, Colby. So also greetings from Boulder, Colorado, a little bit of a rainy day here. Um, so yeah, Court, I work with a company called Natural Habitat Adventures. Uh, my background started really in conservation biology, wildlife biology, and entomology, believe it or not but quickly incorporated ecotourism, uh, now a term we, we also call conservation travel these days, uh, and led me to uh, guiding around the world. I've guided a, you know, a few hundred expeditions over the last 15, 20 years in all seven continents. Um, I focus not just in the polar regions, but also tropical regions. I now, my main hat that I wear is Director of Sustainability and Conservation Travel at Natural Habitat. I uh, liaise with World Wildlife Fund quite often. Um, I help guide and plan our VIP trips, and I do everything sustainability-wise when it comes to our travel company. From uh, carbon offset calculations, we are very proud and privileged to say we are the world's first carbon neutral travel company as of 2007. We've recently upped the ante on that. I'm sure this will come out in today's discussion. 
And most recently, our next big industry first was leading the world's first zero waste adventure. So there's really cool things like that in the world of sustainability. We like to uh, try to lead the vanguard on that. Um, but then I also get out in the field from time to time and, and guide about maybe eight to 10 trips uh, a year currently still uh, while maintaining these, uh, wearing a few different hats. So thanks very much. Thanks, Court, for being here. Uh, and Melissa. Hi. Um, and just a big thank you to the PTGA for inviting me to take part in this panel. I'm very honored and excited uh, to be here. I'm an environmental specialist at the Association of Arctic Expedition Cruise Operators, and I manage IACO's Clean Seas Project, which um, focuses on reducing single-use waste in the Arctic. Uh, and I also work on a range of tasks at IECO connected to safeguarding the environment. Um, prior to IECO, I worked for the World Wildlife Fund and led projects related to safe shipping uh, and pollution and marine protection in the Arctic. Um, I have a master's in Arctic oceanography and maybe just a little caveat that besides a little bit of moonlighting a few years ago, I uh, am not a guide <laughs> or don't have a lot of experience as a guide, but I'm hoping that I can maybe bring a different perspective to the panel with that. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Uh, and then Ron, that takes us to you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, being a, an expedition leader and lecturer on board ships at heart, it's good to be back with all of you and so many friends who I know are participating. I first started going to the Antarctic a way long time ago in 1982. I've only missed three seasons therein and seem to have graduated from being an expedition leader to founding my nonprofit science an education organization, Oceanides, in 1987. In 1994, after having proposed an Antarctic Traveler's Code that was picked up by IATO and all the treaty parties, we actually at Oceanides embarked on a project called the Antarctic Site Inventory, which just finished its 26th consecutive season of data collection about penguins and seabirds in the peninsula. Four years ago, we started a continent-wide Antarctic penguin database called MAPT, and we'll make sure you get links to all of this. And we're basically truth tellers trying to force conservation forward by making sure that all the stakeholders in the Antarctic region are working from the same set of data. Uh, it seems to be working. We participate as observers at CAMLAR. And we work closely as best we can with the tour operators organization, IATO, with the krill fishers organization, for example, they're called ARC. And we're just hoping now to use our expertise in understanding how penguin populations are changing to talk up what is really the global issue of our time. Obviously, we're all faced with this terrible global pandemic we don't know when the curve will be flattened and we'll all be able to get back south, hopefully, so or north, sooner rather than later, we hope. But following on to the end of the pandemic, the next wave is all going to be about climate change. And we're trying to use the penguin data and the analyses that we've done to more definitely expand the cohort of people worldwide who can talk about climate change in a way that makes sense. And we'll get into this, I'm sure, today, how to talk to folks who may not be as inclined, say, politically, to really care about climate change. I think we all need to get into that mode and try to work as best we can to expand the conversation. Anyway, it's great to be here. I'm thrilled to be able to participate and many, many thanks to all of you for asking me to join up. Thank you for being here, Ron, we appreciate it. Uh, and then once again, I'm Colby, I'm the moderator for today. Uh, I am also a senior polar guide uh, and I sit on the board of directors for the organization as well. I'm an expedition leader in both poles. I work in Canada and Greenland um, at base camps for natural habitat adventures. Uh, and then I work for uh, a, a couple of different companies in Antarctica on the small cruise ships, uh, as well as um, in the yachting community. Uh, 
For those of you that have just joined, uh, I'll encourage you to check out the Q&A tab that's on the bottom right hand corner of your Zoom screen. Uh, if you'd like to ask any questions of the panelists as the presentation goes on, please feel free to put your questions in there. Uh, those will be monitored and then uh, fed over to me by Lauren Farmer. Uh, and I'd like to give a, a big shout out to Lauren for organizing these polar panel sessions. Uh, everything from the, the overall vision to the, the marketing to the behind the scenes uh, operational stuff here today. So thank you, Lauren, very much for that. Uh, and we'll do our best to include as many of your questions uh, as we can. You'll also notice that there's a chat um, box down on the bottom. Uh, you're welcome to use that. We're not monitoring the chat. So if you have questions, do put them in the Q&A box um, as a preference. So thank you for that. Uh, and then how about we dive right in. Um, Ron, you, 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 you kind of had my ear there. You were talking about, talking about climate change. Uh, and I, I feel like for a lot of guides, uh, particularly on the on some of the, the cruising ships, I've been there and and people are hesitant to want to talk about climate change because it can be perceived, unfortunately, as as political. Um, can you can you speak to that a little bit? How can we all be putting our best foot forward and talking about these issues? Sure. Um... <clears throat> I've had some experience on uh, the ships, for example, having to give a penguin lecture in front of folks from who had chartered the ship in this case. Uh, they're all uh, Fortune 500 executives whose politics were somewhere near that of Attila the Hun. So I knew I was walking into a hornet's nest of folks that you know, just really, we're not necessarily going to agree with understanding what I'm doing, what the penguin counts mean, what the trends mean. And the talk went really, really well. And when it was over, I asked for questions. And uh, the first question was, how do you get published? How do you publish a paper? And I talked about posing a research question testing it out, you know, getting your dollars together to go south, grab the data, analyzing the data. And finally, when you have a conclusion, I said, and you can convince the editor that with a 90 or 95% probability, uh, your conclusions match to the data, you're going to get published. You have to write well, of course. At which point, all 100 hands in the room went up in the air. And I remember screaming into the microphone, what's going on here? I didn't say anything about sex, politics, or religion. What did I say that was controversial? And the response was that I said I could be wrong by 5% or 10%. I raised a lot of money from those folks. And what I realized is that if you portray yourself as somebody who respects the intelligence of those you're talking to, and you exude a lot of gray matter instead of being dogmatic about you got to do this or you got to do that, people will try to listen. So I would encourage everyone to suck it up, take a deep breath, march on forward and try to get to know everybody who's in your flock on that particular outing venture or sailing. Uh, you'll never know who you'll be able to connect with. And the other part of this is that in the peninsula, as uh, at Arctic Peninsula, as I'm sure all of you know, it's warmed a hell of a lot in the last six plus decades. That trend may be leveling off, but one species of penguins is really doing well, the Gen 2 penguins. Adelis and chin straps are not, and they're biological creatures just like we are. And I'm getting a lot of mileage pointing out that we humans are mere millennial twigs on the evolutionary tree, whereas these penguins in some form or another have been around for 40 or 60 million years. Ergo, they're sending us messages about adapting to a changing climate that we ought to think about. Are we going to adapt well like a Gen 2 penguin in the future or not? Will we have food to eat, a good home, a good healthy environment? and keep producing kids and grandkids. And when you get to the kids and the grandkids line, that really sucks in a lot of attention and a lot of notice. So I guess I'm uh, sorry, apologies for being long-winded. 
I just think there is a way to talk about climate change. I think we all need to try to do it. And uh, it's amazing how you can turn a few people around. Some folks you're just never going to get. But there are some folks out there who just haven't heard the climate change message the right way. And I think we all should get out there and try to snatch them into our, our wings and bring them close to the issue. Thanks, Ron. And I just want to follow up, if that's OK, to my fellow panelists. And I, I want to build on what Ron just said, is that you know we have sort of in our back pocket our presentations and our recaps, which are super important. But one of the benefits of traveling to Antarctica or the Arctic is that it's usually a very experiential um, thing for people and that people can learn or receive information better if they live it and touch it. So you sort of like open up those receptors, kind of as Ron was saying, how he gradually led them into the science thing, or if you do thing hands-on, which for me is why citizen science is super powerful. So I'll talk a little bit about citizen science, but then talk about the impacts that I've seen on people is that, um, you know, as the collective, we, we use the word leverage, which I hate because it's business jargon, but actually it captures what we do. We, our mission is to leverage the reach of um, polar travelers to enhance understanding and protection of the polar regions and also get data for scientists. So it's a win-win. So the collective started by taking projects that already existed and then uh, that worked with what we wanted to do. So some NASA Globe Cloud, Observer, Seabird Surveys, Happy Whale and Ice Watch, and now we're actually working with scientists to get even better, more streamlined projects that work well on ships so that you can have five minutes or 20 minutes to do these science projects. So what does that mean? Like my experience is, does it have an impact? And from my own company, so not with the Polar Citizen Science Collective hat, is I've done follow-up surveys and nine times out of 10, my passengers say that when they go home and they talk to friends and family about their amazing Antarctica trip, is that they include science in the discussion. So it, it makes an impact. Um, and also, you know, those same passengers who have done a basic level of science, when they go home and talk to their granddaughter's second grade class, they can talk more about more than just pretty pictures or more about how, more than just how they, you know, moved across the Drake. But um, they can also start sharing the science they did with a second grader who actually eats that stuff up. So I think it's really important that hands-on experience, which maybe they don't even register that it's this high level of climate change, but they're starting to talk about science. And I think that's really important. Yeah, excellent stuff there, Laura. Uh, just to quickly jump in, a um, couple quick thoughts. One is that I think we in the industry should embrace um, the opportunity to, to not necessarily preach to the choir, to, to enter those conversations. Because in the world of conservation travel and ecotourism and, and nature travel in general, we get a lot of people that think like, maybe like us, you know, that we, we totally get it. We're, we're, we're part of it. Preaching to the choir is great. You get them to amplify their voices, but it's a, a really unique and special opportunity to have access to people. And I, I'll admit, it's like the minority of people that are on my trips that do not understand or do not believe it. Um, so I think embrace it, first of all. And the second thing is one thing that was taught to me way back in the day that I, I really I would like to pass on to you is one of the greatest ways to start the conversation is remove the human causation element of climate change. And I think that that really, really helps open the door because that, that's actually one of the most defensive controversial parts and it doesn't actually matter. Um, if you say it doesn't matter if humans cause it or they're not causing it. The point is we understand the correlation between atmospheric carbon uh, in temperature, we understand the negative ramifications of temperature, and we also have an ability to capture carbon and offset it and reduce it. Therefore, it doesn't matter if we're causing it or not. We have an ability to solve the problem. Let's move that. Let's move past whether we're the bad guys or not. Hell, we're the good guys, sure. Um, and that really opens the door. And I think people are a little bit more um, comfy talking about it, whether they're on one side of the fence or the other. Great, thank, thank you all uh, for that. Let's see, how, how about if we follow up then? It sounds like a lot of this, uh, you guys, Laura and Ron in particular, you're sort of leaning towards telling the stories of science and letting that be something that can catapult you into these bigger picture like themes like climate change. Uh, can, we, can we speak to the importance of, of science and what we, what we see going on down there? Uh, I mean, Ron, certainly we all see, you know, some of the uh, equipment set up um, that Oceanides has uh, at the penguin colonies. It seems like there's a natural connection to seeing what's 
going on with research, being able to talk about why that research is important, what those outcomes might be, and then these conservation messages. Uh, are you guys able to speak to that for us? Sure, absolutely. Uh, most of the equipment is Tom Hartz from the Penguin Watch Project. Although my team goes in and switches out batteries and other parts of those cameras pretty often, there's no question that that's an opportunity to talk about science in the Antarctic. Everything is based on science at the treaty level. Uh, the Antarctic Treaty is putting, has put 10% of Earth away for science, peace, and conservation. And the science part of it's very, very important. There's not a decision made by the treaty parties, whether at treaty meetings or at the Kamlar fishing meetings, that isn't based on the best available science. So one way to get into this is to use the equipment or just simply visiting a site do you know that has penguins and you can look up the numbers and how the numbers are changing. You can talk about how it all works in the Antarctic and how it's really important for scientists from all these different countries, uh, folks who are doing this independently like Tom and I, get more data together means that the decision makers are going to be forced to make a decision that respects those data. And making sure that all those data are publicly available is certainly something that we on the Ocean ID side are trying to do. Uh, try to make as much available to all of you as is possible. And it keeps getting better and better. Uh, we keep adding things to our website all the time. So there's no question that seeing the equipment or getting to any penguin colony, and in particular some that have really been studied a lot, I think really gives an opportunity for all the guides to, you know, upgrade the uh, knowledge of the flock that you're leading. Uh, let them know what it means to track penguin populations and why they as indicator species are helping us understand better not only how the Antarctic is changing, but how the world is changing and how it might affect us when the warming gets our way. Yeah, and um, continuing with uh, Tom Harton's Penguin Lifelines cameras that are set up, I almost use it as a, as a game. Like my guys try to find, you know, with my passengers, we try to find it and then it's a tool when they take home because I say, look, you know, you can go, when you get home, you can click on penguins and these are photos from places that you've been. So again, I think it's important that they don't have this isolated experience in Antarctica where they left on a boat, they go through this magic time warp of the Drake Passage, they appear and then they leave it. But if they can take that experience home, again, they can click on those penguins from cameras they've seen. That's an incredible connection that they can, again, show their friends or whatever and it keeps that story going at home and it's personal for them, which is important. Great, thank you both very much. So let's see, so for some variety, uh, let's, let's switch gears a little bit here. Uh, I actually have a question uh, uh, written out <clears throat> for the group. Uh, so here we are, recently The Guardian ran an editorial piece that said tourism is an unusual industry and that the assets it monetizes do not belong to it. So for example, in the polar regions, that would be um, you know, small Arctic towns, protected wilderness areas, even the ocean itself, things like that, that don't really belong to us that we're monetizing. So there's a potential problem there. Um, you know, so who, who has responsibility for stewardship of those, uh, those assets? We're there, we're profiting off it. Uh, it seems like there's opportunities for us. Um, M Melissa, maybe this is a good question for you um, to start off here. Um, so what's currently being done by, by polar operators to overcome some of this? Um, in say five years from now, what, what do you think all operators should be doing? Yeah, good question. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I think we need to be really vigilant to these issues and ensure that there's also a balance. Um, many people in the Arctic are, are making a living on tourism and many communities depend on tourism. Uh, expedition cruise tourism brings in business opportunities to the Arctic and, um, you know, guests are spending a significant amount of money. And it's not just about money, but it's also about a cultural exchange, uh, experiences, education, uh, development, and sort of the backbone or the backbone of what we do at IECO is the development of guidelines and standards. Uh, and all of our members commit to following these. 
and we have an extensive list of guidelines, um, but we're always learning and trying to do better. So there's many environmental issues that are being raised right now by communities and also at, you know, at all levels at the International Maritime Organization. And it's up to the industry uh, to better understand these issues within the context of the expedition cruise industry uh, and figure out how to mitigate these impacts. So for me, the, the good stewardship uh, would be following what we already know and then trying to figure out um, the new issues that come our way. I think uh, in five years, I mean, my personal focus here is on community engagement. Um, this needs to be a, a real key focus for the industry. And um, while I'm happy to see our community guidelines and engagement being expanded, uh, my hope would be that all operators, whether they're IECO or IATO or, or not, um, have committed to considering uh, community, um, community concerns and voices in their management strategies. Melissa, you had, you had mentioned the uh, Clean Seas program. Is, is that maybe a good example of something specific that, that operators can utilize? Yeah, that's a very, uh, has very direct and sort of uh, immediate uh, benefits, I guess you could say. So the Clean Seas project aims at reducing uh, single use waste in the Arctic. And um, so this is focused on the vessels themselves and reducing waste on board and then also on cleanups in the Arctic. Uh, so this is a great way that passengers and, and everyone can be, can be stewards of the environment and sort of give, give back in a very um, direct way. Yeah, if I can add also, uh, I think the membership of IATO and IATO itself have been incredibly good stewards, great stewards of the Antarctic. Uh, not only promoting site guideline rules so that people tread lightly at all the visitor sites, but the simple fact that the organization itself and so many of its members have been kind to me and my project, Tom Hart and his, they've really ensured that we've had the platform to get the data, to collect the data into a database that can be used by everyone. So high praise from me and Tom and others on our side for the companies getting together and making sure that the science gets done. And quite frankly, uh, I'm very excited to say, and Tom would say the same thing too, it gives us the freedom to do things that some national programs just simply don't have the budget to do. You all help us get, you all in IATO, in particular helping us get all over the Antarctic Peninsula to monitor one of the fastest warming places on the planet. And without your help and support, uh, we couldn't get the work done. So you're being great stewards in my opinion. Uh, yeah, so just th thanks for that, Ron. Um, so just stepping in here, yeah, from like a big picture ecotourism perspective, you know, I think, the people that will most vehemently protect natural resources uh, are those that see value in it or see the most value in it. Um, I think that the polar regions are uh, an exceptional, uh, very interesting example because there's a relatively big discord between um, the infrastructure provided by overseas companies that own the boats and so on and so forth versus the small towns. But I think that um, you know what we do in ecotourism and conservation travel is we create stakeholders. And there's no difference between what is happening here with, with boats coming in or planes coming in or whatever um, versus you know going into small villages in, in, the, in the tropics. And um, you, know, you, you can't just tell people that, um, you know, that they have to appreciate this area. You have to ha let them and allow them and, and instigate them to see value in it. So although I oversee a ton of really cool programs and a lot of other tour operators are doing the same thing with philanthropy, with scholarships, with environmental um, conservation funds, you know, I think at the end of the day, we all in the tourism industry are doing some of the most good by just doing tourism. And that's the coolest thing. And I tell that to my guests often is that, you know, how cool is it that the biggest impact that you have is by simply going on vacation because you're leaving money in local communities, you're, you're creating stakeholders, and you're adding value to these natural ecosystems that local folks can then draw from. So I think that the thing is, is like, I, I'm not sure if anybody has the perfect answer. I certainly don't. 
of like how to further incentivize local communities, how to further create stakeholders. But I think it's something that we as all professionals must constantly challenge ourselves with and think about how can we integrate local folks more? You know, some small village in, in, in Tenet uh, is not going to own a multi-million dollar boat, but how can we wrap them in more in the tourism? Because the more they are stakeholders, they're more going to protect vehemently what they value. Thank you guys. How, how about as a follow up here, I'm, I'm going to try to try to drill down into some specifics again on this one. Um, so we're talking about uh, responsible travel. It's not just environmentalism, right? Uh, we're, we're thinking about, um, you know, social responsibility as well, social stewardship, which is great. What can guides on the ground do like outside of their operators, like when we're in, uh, in particular, I guess we're, we're thinking about communities in the Arctic, uh, in our case. Um, you know, what can guides on the ground do to help uh, make an impact themselves? I can take this one, maybe. Um, yeah, I think there's some, some more obvious things like supporting local businesses, buying local products. Uh, this isn't always arts. It can also be provisions, country food, services, hiring local guides, uh, for, you know, also things like transport, mechanics, cleaning crews. Um, you can also support local culture and music and arts. Um, uh, also sharing photos is a great way after a community visit, uh, sort of connecting back with the community. Um, offering sort of shared knowledge with communities and having a, like coordinating a venue for exchange of, of stories, for example, between, between guests and, and a community. Um, offering uh, social activities to community members. So for example, like ship tours, uh, lunch on board, or organizing sporting events. Um, yeah, that's maybe my, uh, my little list here. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, hit the nail on the head. And I think those concrete examples are, are super helpful. Um, I will just add quickly from a, a big picture perspective, since I, I work heavily in the field and in the office, um, I'll be the first to say that even at the best companies, there is a disconnect of communication and information between the field and the office, and it's something that can always be improved. So I think that simply just, you know, keeping your eyes and ears out for opportunities and communicating those back um, to, to your mothership, <laughs> to your home base, to your point person in the office is extremely helpful because most of the good companies out there of which i think we're all associated with in one way or another they want to they want to level up they want to do the good thing they want to protect their assets and by involving local community uh communities they absolutely know that that's the way to do so so communication i think is is the sort of like another big top-down picture communicate with those that may not be out in the field of what opportunities you see that they can implement because the guys you know we have a lot of flexibility to implement certain things but oftentimes it's the operations, the planning, the office that can do the, the big stuff um, at scale. So making sure they're aware of those opportunities as you see them in the field. Yeah, I think it's that's great points. Uh, I think it's important to mention that like tourism is really only sustainable when it's welcome. So uh, if you're not welcome in a community, it's not sustainable. That's you know, key. Um, and it also needs to have mutual benefits. So it can't happen if there's no community, if the community is left without any benefits or income. Um, and some of the important things here also are like proper contact with communities like we just, we just mentioned and um, exchanging information and having clear arrangements and expectations uh, that are clarified in order to have the success. So like Court was saying, this proper communication also between what's happening and with the, the mothership. the mothership i like that uh thank you all for your perspectives uh let's see i'm going to go to some questions from the crowd here uh and this one's a, a a short leap from what we're talking about now this comes from lizzie uh and lizzie says uh guests are questioning whether or not they could contribute to its demise by visiting um <clears throat> so although some ship companies have started to build more eco-friendly ships uh, is enough being done to minimize the impact of visiting I guess where 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 is that balance is the question here laura 
Yeah, I have also some some thoughts on this as well. And part of it also is the perception that I think we give the guests, like in Antarctica, when they don't see any other ships, they think they're in this wilderness, which is what we want to create for them. And then they go home and they hear that tourism numbers are going up. And they think, oh my gosh, my experience is going to be killed for somebody else. But what they didn't realize is that there were three ships within five miles of them. So, you know, the issue isn't black or white. So I think, and what I mean, my trips that I run are a bit longer, so we have more time with guests and they're small, but while I give my guests a wilderness experience, I also educate them on the fact of what's really going on. That, you know, if we're landing at 1 p.m. at Cooperville, that at 6 a.m. there might have been another yacht that landed with 12 photographers, and at 9 a.m. an expedition ship landed here, and like, hey, isn't it cool that literally 200 other people were here today and it still looks as good as it is? So, you know, I don't want to say we're there's not more to be done, but I think we also need to educate our passengers so when they go home, they understand the current state of Antarctic tourism and that they didn't go there with only 100 people. Like there were 40, 50,000 other people there that season. So for people to spread the right message and see where they fit in, I think is really important. Uh, yeah, ex excellent points. Um, so yeah, just a couple thoughts on that. One is that, you know, and, I'll admit I'm at the helm of a lot of these decisions and I'll admit that I'm not perfect. Like there's always more to be done. We can never rest on our laurels. We can never stop trying to achieve more and more perfection. Um, that all being said, you know, um, you know, we're, we're in a bit of a triage situation in the world today. You know, things are changing at a market pace. And what we're trying to do is um, we will always have an impact no matter where we go and what we do, we have an impact period. The point is that we must have a significantly greater or just any greater, but, preferably significantly greater positive impact than negative impact. We, we have some sort of negative impact, but we're here. And the point is that we have to do more good than bad. And the, the whole point of this advocacy thing is that, you know, we cannot say what we do not love and we cannot love what we do not know. And I think we're all in the business of getting people to know and to love these places and act as advocates um, in a variety of ways when they return home. Um, in these places, if, if, if they're not seen, they can easily be converted into an oil field or a parking lot or whatever metaphor you can pick. So we, we must concentrate on doing disproportionate good always and never settling on enough. Always be raising that bar. Okay, so let me, let me then throw this back into the realm of guides on the ground. Um, so one thing that comes up a lot is, hey, we're, we're jet setting all over the world. We're not just visiting there once to gain an appreciation and then we're gonna donate to our favorite charity. We're going there time and time and time again. Um, talk, talk to me about what guides can do to say, reduce their own travel footprint, uh, th things like that. How can guides minimize their impact? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one uh, just because just I'm, I'm currently doing carbon offset calculations for, for guide travel <laughs> um, like this morning. Uh, so, so yes, um, you can offset, you can carbon offset your flights. Now, fortunately, we at NADHAB, we, we do that for all of our guides, all of our travelers, all of our trips around the world. Uh, it's expensive um, as an aggregate, you know, doing thousands of travelers a year. Um, but on an individual level, you know, you're probably talking about you know, something in the, you know, couple dozen dollars uh, per trip or per season. Um, I'm working with ATTA right now, um, and that's Adventure Travel Trade Association, and they, they will uh, allow you to buy in for these carbon offset credits at a lower rate. For those that don't know about carbon offsetting, it's essentially investing in programs that um, either sequester carbon from the atmosphere, like tree planting, investing in renewable energy to minimize um, carbon that would have otherwise been created. And I'll tell you, having just gone through a litany of websites in the past couple of days, looking at what's out there still, or currently, there are more companies making it easier than ever to offset. I also think it's not a bad idea to put some pressure on you, the companies you work for to see if they will do that as well. Um, I think carbon offsetting is indeed a Band-Aid for the problem. It's a big Band-Aid, it's a, it's a good Band-Aid, um, but you know, we also have to think about how to minimize those emissions too. When it comes to flights, you know, we're not, we're, we're a fair bit of ways from, you know, battery powered airplanes. We're not like, you know, lifetimes away, it's going to happen, but it's, it's that constant balance. Um, but in the meantime, you know, I honestly think if, if, 
you know, just to go to the end of the spectrum, if every single person in the world offset their emissions, we'd be in a really good place. So it's not, it's not a drop in the bucket. So yes, um, if you wish to learn more on that, uh, Google has many, many, many web pages. I will say personally, we work with a company called South Pole. Um, they're very Googleable, southpole.com. Um, and they do, <laughs> is that a word, Googleable? Uh, and so they, they will calculate your emissions starting and ending airport code. Um, they will allow you to invest in projects. Um, and it's, it's actually a lot more affordable than you may think. Yeah, and just to add on to that, and this is the phrase that came up at the field staff meeting for IECO and IATO last September, and it stuck with me because I really liked it. So, you know, yes, you've flown around the world to get to Antarctica. You've maybe or maybe not done carbon offsets, but once you've gotten there and once your guests have gotten there, I like this idea of make the miles count or make the miles matter. You know, you're now there. You've basically invested this carbon to be there. So, you know what? Do some citizen science try to get some people to go home with a better experience. Like I view it as my carbon payment, but make it count. So I think that's really important. And if Colby asked the right question, I can talk more about citizen science, but like make it, make it matter, make the miles matter. I think, uh, I think we can also think a bit more about what the industry itself can do. Um, uh, just maybe as an example, uh, uh, sometimes ships can use a, a fuel oil called heavy fuel oil that is uh, emits black carbon. It's really bad for the environment. It also has sulfur and nitrogen that's bad for human health. And um, these sorts of changes will have a huge impact on the footprint of the industry. And uh, I think we also need to think about pushing the industry itself. And, you know, it's up to the industry to make those changes, but uh, to make those changes in order to reduce the footprint. Last very quick thing. Um, think about, I know we have a, a very international um, number of guests and participants out there, uh, but I know at least in the US about two years ago, there was this massive movement to ban plastic straws and plastic straws are bad. Um, and I can't believe it, in a good way how quickly that momentum changed the culture of, of many, many towns in the US and I think the world as well. So the, you know, as you start to envision these changes and getting more people to buy into carbon offsetting and carbon reduction, just think of that as an example, as this, this random little thing, you know, plastic straws, which truly account for like 0.003% of plastics. Um, had this huge amplifying effect to think about plastics, to think about microplastics. And it started a revolution with, with one thing that didn't have, it didn't carry a lot of weight in the beginning. And I always think about that when I want to kind of create my own movements. And I think that, you know, this, this carbon offsetting, carbon reduction is another big one. Uh, well, it is much bigger, uh, but just think about how that plastic straw thing uh, went down with social media and advertising and influencing businesses. I think it's a good lesson in case study. Hey, thank you all. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, we're, we're getting a few different questions that are sort of follow ups to these. I'm going to try to try to marry some of this together. Um, I had a couple notes too. And so for viewers, you might be interested in knowing. Um, let's see. So polar tourism, uh, it's been growing exponentially, of course. I think we all know that. Uh, an interesting number from IATO, uh, they're reporting a 53% increase in visitation to Antarctica over the past five years alone. Um, so the ELs, they, they do a pretty good job, like Laura was saying, I think, of like keeping the ships away, creating the, you know, this idea that, hey, we, we really are in this, this pristine wilderness, but we all know that there are a lot of, uh, of folks coming. So, you know, what, what, is, what is sustainable for an area are some of the questions we have coming in. Um, and then uh, again, guides on the ground, like boots on the ground, like we think of things like minor transitory impacts and things like that in, in places like uh, penguin colonies, just the little incremental bits that end up over time or over a season having a, a big effect. Uh, can we speak to that? Can we speak to things that guides again can do to be better stewards when they're uh, organizing groups on the ground? Um, Ron, is this a good place to start with you? I mean, certainly you've seen these penguin colonies season after season, decade after decade, uh, what, what are your feelings on this? Uh, my feelings are that there is really good communication between us on the Ocean ID side and other penguin researchers like Tom Hart and the IATO leadership. 
and constantly talking about this question of sustainability, there is some concern that there's not only a great increase in tourism, but a greater concentration on certain locations that are favored. And I know the industry is well underway with discussions about how potentially, uh, let's use the phrase, spread things out a bit so that there's potentially fewer visits to certain locations that continually year after year uh, get a lot of visitation. I mean, some of that pressure is obviously being applied by governments who manage the Antarctic Treaty System. IATO has an amazing historical track record of always leading the charge on these kinds of issues to make sure that it deals with these kinds of issues ahead of time. Uh, I can tell you that I already have had my postseason debrief uh, with Amanda and others at IATO, Amanda Linus, who oversees all of this stuff, and I think is present today. Hello, Amanda. And we'll be talking with her again before the season begins for further updates. So what we're hoping to do is keep feeding into IATO and all the member companies the most up-to-date information we have about where there may be certain pressures, where we may be seeing penguin colonies changing, and at the same time, trying to understand better the role of the krill fishing companies in Antarctica. And the one that's the most difficult of all are the changes wrought in both the Arctic and the Antarctic because of the carbon that we at mid-latitudes are putting into the air. Um, we could have a lot more stringent site guidelines or marine protected areas, but none of that helps to control climate change. So there's this big elephant up in the sky out there called climate change, called carbon, that we can't deal with. But I think the back and forth uh, between the operators and the scientists really is important. Site guidelines are continually being updated and reviewed. And I guess it behooves all of us, not only those who are doing science work, but all those who are leading folks on the ground to make sure that they're up to date on the latest news about changes in the site guidelines or changes at some of the colonies where there is concern that there's been too much visitation. And just to follow up on that, Ron, um, you mentioned the guidelines for IATO as well as IECO. And one thing I always try to stress is that often as guides, um, I feel like those guidelines could be seen as annoying rules but really they should be seen as tools to be good stewards. You know, this is somebody is giving you the tool to be a steward for the penguin colony, for those sea lions that are there. So view them as your stewardship toolkit and not as an annoying rule that you have to follow. You know, like if you really want to step up your game, not only change your percept perception of the guidelines, try to encourage your other expedition team as well as to the guests, like, hey guests, these are our tools to protect this place, not, oh, we have to follow these rules. So, you know, use these tools. Thanks. I, uh, I, yeah, I completely agree with Laura and Ron. I think it's really important to ensure that there's competencies and experiences with ELs and guides. And, you know, hence ECHO and Adam's field staff online assessments and especially the work of PTJ is just really important. Um, and especially with many new guides in the field, I think it's really important that the you know, the experienced guides and staff are able to sort of pass down their competency and knowledge to these new guides as well. Um, and I think, like Laura mentioned, it's really important that guides are informed of all the tools, such as the scheduler and the guidelines, and that they understand how important it is to adhere to everything that's been decided as common practice and as regulations. Um, you know, it might be tempting every once in a while to do something that's not in the regulations, but I think the consequences for this could be extremely large and massive. Um, so that's something to definitely think about. Yeah, th thank you. I think that that's a good message. And I'll just I'll just comment on some comments and questions that are coming in just to bring it to everybody's attention. So there's been as as this portion has been going on, uh, there's been talk about, you know, tourism is potentially just a small impact when you start thinking about some of the larger issues that we're talking about plastics and seas and climate change and things like that um, but the idea is that if if we're all adhering to the guidelines then tourism is having a small impact 
um, if we're not adhering to that, um, you know, we're going past this idea of minor transitory impacts um, and not sort of respecting that, yes, when we leave, there's going to be another group and potentially another group. Shoot, I mean, this year down in, on the peninsula, <clears throat> I saw four different groups at some sites, um, you know, per day. It's kind of crazy. So we're getting a lot of comments on that. So thank you, everybody, for, for your comments and for sharing. It sounds like that's uh, a very important idea for everybody. Uh, let's see, the other thing that we're getting a lot of um, feedback on right now is uh, citizen science. Uh, so, so Laura, maybe we'll, we'll direct a little bit of this over to you. Um, we have a question here. Uh, so citizen science seems like a natural low bar of entry when it comes to conservation discussions. It allows guests to participate in research, which will drive conservation, diversifies the educational program on board, and it makes a real difference in data collection for scientists. Moreover, the participants themselves are guests. They often bring home a unique story regarding their own involvement and instantly become ambassadors who raise awareness of these projects. So why aren't all operators offering citizen science? What are the barriers to entry on that? Uh, where, where does this fit in our programming? Great and good question because we get that a lot from operators of how do I get into it and from guides saying my operator's not doing this. So why aren't they doing it? There's some perceived reasons or excuses, and then there are some real reasons. So I think the perceptions or excuses is that, oh, my clients don't want citizen science. But my own experience and the polar collective experience is in general, that's not true, that most of the people of our passengers wanna travel with a purpose, and this helps give them that purpose. Then there are real issues, right? I mean, there's only 24 hours in a day, which Antarctica can feel like 20 hours of being awake because of so much sunlight. Um, and there's still only so much you can do. So the day is busy and I fully appreciate that. So if you're a guide and if your operator hasn't really signed on to the citizen science thing, the good news is there's still stuff for you to do. Um, so first of all, I'd encourage you to visit the Polar Collective Page. There's projects there that you can do that literally take five minutes of your time. There's seabird um, inventories where you know you're standing on the deck with your passengers anyways pointing out birds so why not do some clicks on your phone and have them type in some data and they're already connecting. Um, also if you're a guide and have access to the IATO FOM, I encourage you to dig deep. It's in one of like the lower folders so you literally have to dig deep but there is really good citizen science information in there on the Polar Collective project. So I would encourage you to read up and maybe pick one or two that interest you and then contact us. Like we'll help you get started. Again, for some, you only need your phone. Other projects might require more materials, in which case you might need operator support, but literally you can get on your phone. So our experience is that Science on boats can be both bottom up and top down in terms of we've seen a lot where it's guides doing the basic stuff and then getting positive feedback from passengers, which gets feed fed back to the operators in the office saying, hey, look, they really like this. So maybe we can get some more operational support. So if your operator's not doing it, I encourage you to start in on one of our easier projects to get going. And the good thing is with our projects is I really hate citizen science that just does science to make you like feel good that's not actual like science but all of our projects are vetted so it's real science and you know we're getting to a next stage where we're even working with the scientists to make sure that we're really matching what could be done on a boat to make it even easier for guides um, you know it does take some time some are five minutes some are more um, but I encourage you just to get out there and start doing something, even if it's just for you, right? If it makes you feel better because you are collect, we live in a data happy world, right? So every data point counts. You know, if we only have one data point, but suddenly we have a hundred, it means that that scientist has better data. And as Ron says, data is what the decision makers need. So, you know, it seems really disconnected that what you're doing on your ship can actually affect the treaty party, but really they make decisions on data. So it's super important. Like, Every mile counts, every data point counts as well. Um, and, you know, and just how does that affect people? I was doing a water sampling once for microplastics and in 2015 I shared what I was doing with someone and I also shared how, you know, you can have microplastics from washing your clothes. And her response was, wait a minute, are people going down to the beach and rolling in the oceans with their fleece jacket? And I said, no, no, it's from the washing machine, right? And this is a very smart woman. 
And that was 2015, but skip ahead to 2020 and the public awareness of microplastics is huge. And that's just because there's been the straws initiative as court said, but also, you know, I started talking about the projects we were doing. And so it has this effect, even the small projects are super important, both for the data and for the communication of, of what's going on. Thanks. So yeah, awesome, awesome stuff. Um, so kind of putting my, my operator hat on, I can say one of the, the maybe not biggest discords, but a discord that's likely to come up between the field and the office is always, well, what are the deliverables? What's the follow up to this project? Because I've been slowly instituting citizen science here at NADHAB. It's like, okay, cool. So we get the ELs to explain this and the clients to do it. Like, but they're going to ask what happened to it? What it, where are the data? And I think that when you are picking your projects and, and vetting them, if you, if you can find those projects that already have websites that are churning this stuff out and all you got to do is send an email, send an email with websites, you know, to the guest list, um, that, that satisfies that for the office um, in, in a big, big way. Yeah, Laura. Cord, how much did I pay you to just like ask that question and comment? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, great. Yes, that is actually part of as we develop new projects. Part of it is that not only are we developing the educational component so that you can have that PowerPoint or whatever to go with it, but also that there's feedback. So kind of like with Happy Whale, when you can submit your photo and then like a year later, you get that email that says, hey, your whale has been connected. You know, every project is gonna have a different feedback mechanism because not all is like a matching whale. But the idea is that with the projects, we'll also have feedback, whether it's, hey guys, this season there were 200 samples collected and now this paper is about to be written. Or because of these three seasons of data, you know, what is that feedback? So our goal is to feedback both to the operators and even to the guests themselves so that they can stay connected. Because again, it's all about taking Antarctica home with you and not making it just that solitary experience. We uh, just, uh, just like two, three weeks ago, we did a survey actually of our IACO members on citizen science and tried to get information on what they're doing and what their challenges are. And I'm noticing, uh, Laura, that a lot of what you said actually matches perfectly with what our survey results are saying and that it was, you know, a lot of capacity and time of staff, um, space on board, specialized equipment, uh, and the flexibility of the projects to sort of match with trip itineraries. And it sounds like from what both of you are saying that, you know, a lot of these challenges could sort of be overcome by making sure that the research project is really matching with, you know, within the framework of expedition cruising. Sorry, just one more. Oh, sorry, Ron, real quick and then I'll get to you. Um, and, you know, Melissa, we've actually as the collective taken this COVID downtime to even bolster some of our applications for scientists and one of you know, we actually have two parts. There's the science part, and then there's actually like, can we do it on board? And so the goal is it has to be guide-led. You know, you, you don't have to have a PhD to be able to carry this stuff out. You know, it might take a little bit of training, 10 minute webinar or whatever, but that it's not rocket science, um, and that it's just very deployable into the field. So we're trying to really cater to the guides, you know, we're, we're a group of guides. We know, we know what works, we know what doesn't, and make sure that the scientists can, because you with some small tweaks, the data collection be, can be totally changed to make it work and for win win for both. Ron, did you have something to add there? Not me. Keep going. I'm okay. So, so our 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 Q and A is blowing up. So I'm going to keep this going for a minute because there's uh, there's clearly some interest. So this this comes from Marcelo. Um, so having passengers involved in data collection is something that is great and should be encouraged. But what about the quality of the data when you have untrained people uh, with you as the guide uh, doing other activities at the same time like bird surveys? Data is crucial in scientific work. Um, is, is it working? Can it be improved? Thank you, Marcelo. So one of the tools that we're in the process of developing is the, an app. And actually, the app will really help drive some of that data. So instead of just like scribbled stuff on a piece of paper that ends up in somebody's, you know, dry bag, 
instead of having you know two degrees Celsius versus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, the app is going to force users in a good way to put data in like in a correct format before you can get to the next stage. So for us, having that is going to be one of the parts of kind of dummy proofing. I don't want to say we're all smart guys, right? But you know, dummy proofing the data is that if you have to follow a certain format based on what the app tells you then that's one step into that. And it also means the data doesn't get lost. Um, you know, it is a challenge to train everybody. Um, again, the, the goal is that it's not overly difficult um, and so that some of the stuff is pretty basic. And it's also why we work with the scientists to make sure that how the data is collected is somewhat dummy proof as well. So it's how we develop the projects using the app to keep the data in. I mean, as well as, yeah, there is some training, but it's a trade-off on getting all those data points with maybe a slightly larger margin of error versus not having those data points. Thanks. Yeah, one, one thing I'd like to add is that, you know, citizen science is getting better and better and better, as you just elucidated, Laura. Um, however, if this is just my opinion, but if, if that is your personal hang-up, is that you don't know if the data is really that good, I still feel like citizen science has a huge, huge important role just for the fact that it teaches scientific literacy with your guests. I think that's a big limiting factor in the understanding of climate change, of the biodiversity crisis, of habitat loss, of all the major issues. And, and if you come from an academic, academic background and you know the I, ideas and fundamentals of publishing papers and 95% confidence intervals and that sort of stuff and can explain it, people, if you haven't come from an academic background, do not know that. So I think just if the data gets, I mean, again, I'm not saying you should do this, but if the data gets thrown away, it still has a huge benefit because you're teaching scientific literacy. People now appreciate how, what, what, what goes into these scientific studies to give us the knowledge we have. So that's, that's a big, big part of why I like to institute this, um, irrespective of, of the data. But the data, of course, is fantastic. Yeah, let me uh, add on to that. I totally agree. I mean, it's really hard to get 100 passengers on one of the ships where we're working to get involved in the site-wide penguin count. However, we can take the time at a few key locations when we're done with our counting to actually take folks aside with us and show them how we do it. I mean, how do you count, you know, 4,322 penguins in two hours. Well, there's a way to do it. You have to know what you're counting. You have to know what counts you want to discard. But I totally agree with the notion that showing folks how you do the work, how you take the data from your field notebook and enter it into the computer, and then show them some of the papers or analyses that you've come up with. What you've done is create, as was just said, folks who are totally scientifically more literate than they were before. And that's really important. And I just want to note that all of the projects that the Polar Collective is developing, one of our key goals is that the data doesn't get thrown away and that it actually gets used. So <laughs> Court, we need to continue talking. No, um, but that is actually important to us, that it's a win-win for both, that it is a really exciting experience for passengers and it's a win for science. And um, you know, we've got our ears on the ground to a lot of the citizen science stuff. And there's even like a whole kind of mission statement for citizen science. And half the mission statement is that people are out there doing it. But the other half is that the data that comes in is actually good and usable. So, and that we're not just doing it to throw our hand, which is good. Again, it's a learning process, but the goal is that it's win-win it's for both sides. So you know, if that's your concern, like don't hold back, jump right in because there's really good data coming out of this. Yeah, let me clarify. Don't throw data away. <laughs> Just saying, if you remove that entire section, it's still worth your time. <laughs> what, what about making up data? I did a lot of science in high school for science fairs, just by, you know, kind of getting the gist of it and filling in the rest of the table. Uh, all right, thank you all for your perspective on citizen science. Uh, let's let's switch over. There's a, a, a few random questions that are here that I'm going to kind of lump lump together. Uh, I'll I'll start here. So not all trips in the polar regions are focused on natural history and storytelling. Uh, 
So I can think of specialized departures like ski mountaineering and, you know, diving, snowmobiling up in the Arctic, sled dog tricks. Uh, you know, certainly there's, there's an amount of interpretation, of course, that's, that's taking place on these trips. Um, but maybe they're not um, quite, uh, you know, geared the same way as to diving into management issues and conservation issues, stewardship, that sort of thing. Do you feel like those trips, um, those guides should still feel a responsibility to try to message some of this, even though it's not what people are primarily signing up for when they join a trip? Who wants to jump on that grenade? Sure, I'll go for it. So um, responsibility, yes, but mainly opportunity. Like opportunity, yes, absolutely. There's a huge opportunity because this group of people, they are stakeholders. They want to snowmobile on snow. They don't want to snowmobile on gravel. Like there has to be snow. So they, they actually have a vested interest in keeping this the way it is. Um, in addition, it's go it goes back to that preaching to the choir thing. Um, and uh, you know what that means is that we often have uh, direct communication to people that believe the same things we do. So if you, if you jump to a different sector, to different people, to different ways of thinking, you have an opportunity to educate people that may never otherwise understand this very, very important point of view. So I think a huge opportunity, you know, responsibility is kind of like a guilty word, but yeah, I, I think you have some, I think, I think, I think you should do it. <laughs> yeah. And as Court just said, I actually think you have an even easier opportunity in some ways because they're really experiencing the landscape or wherever you are through this very specific medium. And as Court said, they have a reason to save it, right? So, you know, after a dog sledding trip, you're not gonna go into a tent and watch a PowerPoint on climate change, but you can talk about what are the changes you've seen or how the snow has changed or the ice has changed and how you can go some areas, but not other areas. So, you know, talk about it in relation to, as Court said, what they're doing, they care, they're stakeholders. So making it make sense. But I think it's almost easier in a way. These people care about what they're doing through a very exciting medium. And, and one thing I'll say just very quickly is that when you go into these conversations, never hesitate to start and stick with the absolute basics. That's something I've just learned from guiding. Like you, you do not have to have a complete education on this nor give it. Um, people that are even very well educated um, have not heard this stuff as much as we have. So remember, you can always just have little snippets and basics. You don't have to have a super advanced conversation on it. That, that, that's actually a good point, Court. Um, here, here, here's one off the cuff then from me. So I, I found in speaking with guys, particularly on, on the cruise ships, a, a lot of times folks come in with a particular expertise, right? Um, and so they may not feel like it's their place to talk about, you know, wh wh whatever it is, because they're supposed to be talking about something else. But we all have this sort of concern and general awareness and knowledge of things. So how much do people have to, you know, be an expert in order to be able to talk about some of these stewardship, sustainability, conservation issues, versus how much are they just out there trying to raise awareness for people that are on trips with them? Maybe I'll jump in, but I might go on a small tangent. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, I think what we really need to remember is that we need to also take a bit of caution in this area and that uh, guides and tourists are visitors to an area that's inhabited by millions of people. And these people are, you know, depending on the livelihood and the natural resources and um, speaking about these areas uh, can sometimes um, be damaging. Uh, not only to the tourism industry, but also to local life and advocating for things like, you know, hunting. So I think we also need to be in an area where we have a, a great understanding. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we need to sort of take this area with a bit of caution as well. And again, I'm just throwing that in there as maybe a, a side tangent. I'm curious, Melissa, just because I don't work in the Arctic, like what are some examples of maybe ha what you've seen of like a negative way someone might have over kind of? Yeah, so if you're, um, uh, and this is maybe something that's happened in past years, maybe not even within my lifetime, <laughs> but advocating against uh, like seal hunting, for example, um, and then that having major consequences on uh, the people who rely on seals for a source of food, rely on seals for their culture and you know 
um, the tourism industry can have an extreme negative impact by advocating for something that they don't necessarily understand. Uh, so we need to sort of keep that in mind when we're being put into this sort of advocacy role that we also need to have a, a very good understanding. Yeah, I would say the ideal situation is to have yourselves a very, very deep understanding, but explain it, be able to explain it in a very, very simple way and build on it when and if you do get those guests that wish to, because it will happen eventually. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think you owe it to yourselves to, to dive deep on some of these issues. I think we're all in guiding because it's interesting to us. So I personally don't see that as a limiting factor. I think everybody in the audience today many are experts and many can be experts within a few, you know, a short time of studying and reading up on these things. But again, ideal being very widely knowledgeable and then explaining it in a very simple way. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's see, we, we have a, a comment and then I'm going to follow that up with a, a related question here. Um, but uh, for uh, everybody's knowledge, uh, this is from uh, from Amanda, and she says that on beach cleanups, et cetera, things like that, uh, IATO now has a form in the field operations manual for opportunistic collection of marine debris in Antarctica. And then that data is all submitted to a CAMLAR database. So if you're interested in that, uh, that sort of opportunistic stuff with your guests when you're down in Antarctica, look for that in the field ops manual. And then, and then a follow-up question here. Um, I'm not sure who this is from. Uh, maybe it's just a, a few different questions together. Actually, it looks like that Laura Lawrence fed to me. Uh, so beach cleanups, could we organize more of these? Uh, infrastructure and development of disposing of it, what to do with it once we found it, and beach cleanups in the north are great, but who and how uh, can we be lobbying in the fishing industry, which create most of that trash to be picked up? We talked to beach cleanups. Is it, Melissa, this is, this is your wheelhouse. Yeah. So start us off. <laughs> yeah. I can start. Um, there's a lot in that question, I'm trying to remember, but I think one of them was more about challenges, right? Uh, in terms of, sorry, actually, can you repeat it, Colby? Like the, just the main last, it was about. Yeah, sorry, there do. were a few things in there. Um, so <laughs> beach cleanups, um, so some, some questions about uh, organizing these, how, do, how does that work? Um, mm -hmm. What happens to the stuff that we, we collect? Where does it go? Um, and, and then are we working with anybody to identify where that trash is coming from and stop them from, from you know, polluting Okay, it? got it. <laughs> so, um, yes, we can definitely organize more beach cleanups. The members that have, at IECO have been organizing beach cleanups for about, I think it's two decades now. Um, and all the feedback I always get from members is so positive that people get so engaged on this issue and want to clean up beaches and you know, see it as a form of giving back. And um, it's been such a positive, ex positive experience to, to um, see the, yeah, the willingness and engagement to, to pick up litter on Arctic beaches. Uh, we are involved in a few science projects. Uh, one of them is SALT. And so in Svalbard, the waste that's collected by our members and all over Svalbard ends up in a con shipping container um, near the waste reception facility in Longyearbyen. And then there's a group that goes in and they analyze all the waste and they try to figure out what types of waste it is, the origin of the waste and stuff like that. Um, and then that gets fed also into larger processes. So for example, this past October, we were working um, uh, at a workshop with the Arctic Council to make a uh, management plan or strategy for waste management in the Arctic and what can be done. So we're really going from like all levels with with the work we're doing on beach cleanups from picking up waste to the research to um yeah to management to international and federal levels uh in terms of fishing industries and what can be done that's a really difficult one there's a lot of other entities that are working on this like the international maritime organization right now is working on a um a marine litter strategy and it's very heavily focused on the fishing industry because that's you know one of the main contributors at IECO we're um, maybe I'll say maybe starting I don't want to commit us yet because we were hoping to do it this year and now it's been postponed but uh, to work with a company in Germany who makes products out of fishing nets and fishing gear and so when our members collect the fishing gear what what unfortunately normally happens is it 
in Svalbard at least goes to the waste reception facility in Longyearbyen uh, and ends up down in Trimso and ends up in a landfill. Fishing gear is extremely hard to recycle. And there's uh, this company in Germany that's trying to turn it into products. And so we've been trying to work with them um, to figure out how we can get the fishing that's turned into products. Yeah, that's a, I can keep talking for a long time, but maybe I'll stop right there. <laughs> Thanks, that was, a, that, was a good, that was a good synopsis. I, I wonder if anyone wants to speak uh, to, um, to Antarctica. Are we starting to see more trash down in Antarctica? Are um, our research um, you know, vessels as well as cruise operators participating in cleanups when they're at these sites? Um, those, those, those sort of ideas. Can anyone speak to that, Ron? Do you have, you've been, you've been at it for quite a long time. Are you seeing changes down there? Yeah, there's no question there's more garbage showing up. Uh, Amanda's been spearheading, as she mentioned, this effort to try to gather data with all the member companies participating. Uh, on the Ocean ID side, we've had some talks with those folks at CAMAR, that, as you referenced earlier, and we'll try to advance that forward uh, or just early stages. But there's no question there's, there's more and more waste material, fishing gear, and other garbage showing up. I mean, it's not to the point that you get to a landing site and it's totally full of old pails and gear and rope and whatever. Um, but when we're out and about doing our penguin counting and getting to parts of a location that others might not, we're seeing a lot more gear in the water uh, and trying to photograph it, bring it back if we can, collect it. Uh, well, there's definitely been an increase. I think another important point too is that in the Arctic, I mean, you know, you're dealing with Scandinavia and let's face it, their recycling programs are like light years ahead of what we have down south. Um, and so because of pressure from some of the operators, you know, I think we're also seeing some of the gateway ports change some of their operations. Um, you know, I know just in the last month or two um, in Stanley, they've actually started to do tin can recycling, which hasn't been available until now. Um, and also for operators, well, they were giving you a free um, skip for trash collected on beaches, but even more exciting is not just giving you a free skip to go toss into the landfill, but that they're, you know, recycling tin cans now. So, I mean, that's not just operators, but it's a whole push from everyone and every little incentive of people asking, is there recycling, is there this, I think helps. So I think it's also cool, some of the influence of, of the gateways in the South. So I don't have quite the same expertise as my fellow panelists on this. These are amazing bits of information, a big picture. Um, I'll, I'll share one little thing that we do at NADHAB um, is that we have outfitted all of our guides around the world with little eight liter lightweight dry bags um, to take with them if they wish. We've noticed a lot of guides did like to pick up trash where, wherever they were in the rainforest and the cloud forest and the Arctic, Antarctic. And uh, we now supply those. They're washable, they're, they're convenient, they're storable. And like, you know, sometimes these revolutions and new ways of thinking start from the ground up. I can tell you these little eight liter lightweight dry bags are a great way. They're waterproof, they're washable. You know, if, if you have the ability to do so, I'd say it's a cool way, it's a cool way to do it in a grassroots kind of level. And just to add on to that court, so I love that idea. And one of my favorite tips and tricks from when I used to lead backpacking trips, because let's face it, like you see the trash, but you don't really want to pick it up to carry it. So I would always play the game where if you're kind of walking as a group and you pick it up, you have to give it to the person in front of you to carry because they didn't pick it up. So it just sort of incentivizes the group and um, you then end up just picking it up. You might not if you don't pick it up. So um, yeah, I love all the little, I love the bag. It's just a small thing and then it works. So that's good. Okay, thank you all for your perspectives. Uh, we're going to wrap it up a little bit. Uh, I think what I would like to do in the last couple of minutes is ask you uh, to comment on one of two things. So one would be um, if you want to reinforce a particular message of yours from your, your perspective or your organi organization's perspective uh, for everybody. Um, or if there's something we haven't covered yet uh, that you would like to add that you know, a question hasn't been asked, then, then feel free to do that. Uh, and uh, how about Melissa? Shall we start with you? Yeah, 
That's a good question. Um, I think uh, what's really important to remember here, maybe my, this is like a last word, right? Is that, you know, there's marketing, which is really selling the trips. And then you have, you know, the offices and the vessel, that's the infrastructure, but the guides are really the, so key here because they're the ones that are delivering the product, which is, you know, the polar region. And they're the ones that are really making a difference um, in how they do this. And there's so many things to think about and consider, but, um, yeah, uh, it's up to the, yeah, the guide to sort of be the one to, uh, to take on this, this initiative and make a difference. This can be in many different ways. It can be with, you know, organizing a beach cleanup or, um, or participating in a citizen science project or encouraging guests to buy local. There's just so many ways that uh, we can talk about sustain sustainability and stewardship and uh, at the guide level. Maybe that's my, uh, <laughs> my final word of advice. Thank you very much. That's great. Uh, Ron, would you care to share? Um, I'll simply say I don't think there's anybody on the call today or who can hear what we're talking about who isn't doing what we're doing because uh, I mean we love the places we work. We love the animals and the people we meet. And ultimately, we want it to be conserved. Um, and something the court said earlier, I'd want to emphasize on my own. Uh, it may be warming up out there. There's too much damn carbon in the atmosphere. But it's quite irrelevant whether we cause it or not. I think we did, but we don't have to argue about it with others. What I'm concerned about is us humans continuing to be on this planet. And whether it's penguins you work with or seals or whales, these are animals and biological creatures just like we are. And I think all of us who are involved working on the ships, working in the Arctic, working in the Antarctic, I do feel a responsibility to share what I know. And this, I'm not a really religious guy, but I feel very spiritual when I'm in the Antarctic and people who go to the Arctic feel the same way. Uh, this is God's gift. Let's try to do the best we can. Let's learn from our animals and our habitat and ask that question about whether we humans are going to adapt in the future and really have food to eat, a good home, a healthy environment, and keep producing kids and grandkids. Uh, we do have an amazing amount of stewardship to take care of, and I'm glad we're all in it and thinking the same way. Nicely put, thank you. Laura, how about you? Ron, that's really hard to follow because that was pretty awesome. Um, I'm just going to reiterate what I said is make the miles matter. Make them matter for yourself when you're down there and make them matter for your guests. Make sure that they go home with tools in order to explain their experience better to others so that give them tools to be a steward. You know, are we being stewards and can they be stewards? So make the miles matter. That's great. That's a great little little catchphrase for this whole for this whole thing. Uh, Court, that takes it to you to, to close us out. Wow, the last word. I'm going to begin with a joke. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, yeah, I mean, piggybacking on what Laura just said, I mean, that's fantastic. Make the miles count. I personally view tourism, ecotourism, conservation travel as one of the most powerful forces for change and for conservation in the world. It's why I spent a lifetime in college getting a PhD in. I mean, it's, it's, it's my life's work to do this. Um, one thing I want to address is, and this is kind of like the, the question du jour pre-COVID, COVID, is this topic of like, is the, is the carbon emissions worth it, the air travel? Like there's a lot of stuff going on, particularly in Europe, saying like slamming the tourism industry for the, um, the carbon emissions. And I'll say this very quickly, is that, um, so travel and tourism accounts for about 7% of global greenhouse gas emissions, between five and eight, I'm just gonna say like 7% is a pretty high average. Um, there's 93% still out there that's gonna happen if we quit tourism and travel tomorrow. If we quit, there's 93%. I can think of no other way to influence the other 93%, influence the CEOs, the politicians, the whatever that travel these places, get to know it, get to love it, get to save it, than travel, experiential travel in this way. Um, and just as a, a further aside, you know, food waste itself in the world 
accounts for about 11% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, I'm not saying we can't think progressively or we shouldn't think progressively about how to lessen our emissions, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a great tool to influence the rest of the 93%, but the power is all in you and in us of how to convey that and how to teach it. Um, so I think that, you know, constantly think about how can you continually make the power of travel net positive than the impact that we may have. Very nice. Very nice. That, that was great. You guys, it's like we picked the right people. I think I really appreciate your comments. Thank you for sharing today. Uh, thank you to everyone that's out there uh, around the world for joining. I appreciate you sitting in today. Uh, and for sharing questions. And uh, if you do want to refer back to this, remember that you can log on to uh, the PTGA website and have access to this presentation, as well as the rest of our polar panel sessions uh, that have occurred over the last month and a half. And you can always visit uh, Facebook on the Polar Guides group to stay in touch about more, uh, as well as to access the Guides Inside series, which is all posted uh, there that happened um, earlier this spring. Uh, so thank you all for participating today. We all appreciate you sharing your, your expertise and your perspectives. Uh, and I think that'll, that'll do it.